What is the most interesting, top secret document that has now been declassified? Story one, I actually have one for this. The simple sabotage field manual. There are bits that talk about office sabotage that are eerily similar to the way things work in most businesses and also the military. Some keynotes are to delegate many matters to committees so they take longer to resolve and having layers of management needing to be informed on a project before it can be started for even the smallest things. In trains bound for enemy destinations, attendants should make life as uncomfortable as possible for passengers. See that the food is especially bad. Take up tickets after midnight. Call all station stops very loudly during the night. Handle baggage as noisily as possible during the night, and so on. Bus drivers can go past the stop where the enemy wants to get off. Taxi drivers can waste the enemy's time and make extra money by driving the longest possible route to his destination. Hamper official and especially military business by making at least one telephone call a day to an enemy headquarters. When you get them, tell them you have the wrong number. Some of these suggestions are like a Monty Python sketch. Story two, mentioned briefly already, but more info on Operation Northwoods. Declassified in 1998. During the 60s, the US Joint Chiefs of Staff made a plan intending to give the US an excuse to launch war on Cuba. Fake terrorist attacks against their own US citizens to be blamed on communist Cuba. The plan was eventually rejected, but it involved innocent people being shot in the streets, bombings in major US cities, and hijacking planes. The craziest thing is that the Joint Chief of Staff signed off on it, and it went all the way to Kennedy before someone finally saw how insane that plan was. Story three, the building report for MI6 HQ, or more specifically, the partially redacted budget report covering the costs of the custom construction. It's infuriating because it has half stuff in it, like the fact that they spent a ton of money on something that MI6 had to have, that's built into the core of the building and pushed the limits of technology at the time. What the thing is still classified, but you can see how much it cost and a few things that it wasn't because they're listed separately. If I were to guess, I'd say it might be a classified secure location for senior government figures to evacuate to in the event of a major attack on London. Like a contemporary version of cabinet war rooms with enough high-end comms tech to maintain contact with Washington, Moscow, Brussels, and any part of the UK. Vauxhall Cross, after all, is a 30-second helicopter ride from any location in Westminster. Story four. The Nixon campaign sabotaged the Vietnam-Paris peace talks in 1968, which prolonged the war and increased the odds of Nixon being elected. If you've never read it, Hunter S. Thompson's obituary for Nixon is one of the greatest pieces of journalistic savagery in history. If the right people had been in charge of Nixon's funeral, his casket would have been launched into one of those open sewage canals that empty into the ocean just south of Los Angeles. He was a swine of a man and a jabbering dupe of a president. Nixon was so crooked that he needed servants to help him screw his pants every morning. Even his funeral was illegal. He was queer in the deepest way. His body should have been burned in a trash bin. Story 5. Operation Northwoods and MK Ultra have been mentioned already, so let's add the third mega review. Area 51. Declassified back in 2013. Basically confirming what everyone suspected. Alien secret military aircraft testing dating back to the 1940s stuff that was decades ahead of its time, and hinting that there's stuff they're working on now that is just as cool. I genuinely believe that the F-35 is either a front for the real next-gen aircraft that we're all supposed to ridicule and convince ourselves that the military is incompetent and whatnot, so we're all taken off guard by the real stuff or being ridiculed as part of some weird psyop so no one catches on to what it's really capable of. Hey, if that were true, that wouldn't even be the weirdest Area 51 op. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if they have an artificial general intelligence down. I mean, just look at this crap. And that was in the early 90s. Story 6. Short summary. In the lead-up to the Olympics in Mexico in 1968, there were a lot of protests that made the government look bad. There was a large protest in front of a government facility, which was blocked off by a line of police. The government positioned snipers in the buildings nearby, who then shot the police to make it appear that the crowd was shooting the police. The police quickly returned fire, mowing down innocent, nonviolent protesters. Many ended and the crowds fled. Within hours, the entire area of the protest and shootings, all bodies were cleared up, all blood washed away, no signs left. To this day, they still don't know how many people exactly were ended. It did the trick though. There were no more large protests in the lead up to the Olympics. Story seven, I'm going with Project Azorian. 
Interestingly, I was driving northbound with my sister crossing the Benicia Bridge on Interstate 680 back in the early or mid-90s. She was driving. I was just staring off into space and looking to the east to the Liberty Ship Ghost Fleet. Much closer to the bridge lay another ship. I took one look at the ship and said, holy crap, it's the Glomar Explorer. Weird because our family are total landlubbers, but somehow something about this ship was indelibly marked upon my brain. My dad was actually a low-level deckhand on the Glomar Explorer. He just swept floors and made beds and stuff. Right after getting out of high school, he had no idea what it was. I thought it was just some random oil rig or something. He said he did notice there were always guys in white lab coats and military guys, and they all ate lunch or dinner in separate areas where he wasn't allowed to go, but he didn't think much of it. Only worked there for a few months, then got a job somewhere on land. Fast forward a few years, decades, and he saw a documentary on it and was mind blown. Story eight, the legal basis of the state secret privilege came out of a cover up of faulty maintenance on a B-29 and not actual protection of something classified. In 1948, a B-29 bomber that was probably testing a heat-seeking element for an air-to-air -air missile crashed. The families of the victims sued. The military refused to release the accident report as it contained secrets. The family won initially, but lost on appeal. The report was finally declassified, and there is just mention of a secret cargo without specifics. What is mentioned is that there was faulty maintenance and that the aircraft was not airworthy. The whole charade was basically to hide that the Air Force had been negligent. The case was reopened after the report was declassified, but shut down in the courts. So the government uses the state secret privilege to hide embarrassing stuff, and the courts are okay with that. Story 9, the Venona Papers. Almost no one besides the military knew that the Venona Project was going on. The decryption of Soviet communications, spying. During World War II, FDR ordered the return of purchased Soviet codebooks that Finnish soldiers had captured in 1941 due to their invasion by Russia. This delayed the Venona project until 1953. SOS Edward Statinius had ordered the OSS not to purchase the codebooks from Finland, but the OSS bought them anyway. One of Mr. Statinius's aides was Alger Hiss, a communist spy. Joseph McCarthy was always mentioning the threat of communist infiltration, and he was right. The Moynihan Commission wrote in one of its reports that, a significant communist conspiracy was in place in Washington, New York, and Hollywood. The USG never bothered to tell the American public this nasty secret of Soviet infiltration. Story 10. Project Harp, created and led by a true mad scientist, Gerald Bull, with the goal of building huge guns that could launch projectiles and possibly satellites into space. The project culminated in the firing of the Yuma gun, which fired a 400-pound projectile to a maximum altitude of 590,000 feet. The project was eventually canceled, but Bull was still obsessed and moved on to dealing with anyone who supported his projects, including South Africa and Saddam. He was the designer behind Project Babylon. There is some suspicion that Bull was under the control of Western intelligence, or may have been a double agent. He was assassinated outside of his Brussels apartment in 1990 in a style that could have been a scene in the movie Munich. He was mixed up in so much crap that the list of possible assassins is long, including Iran, Israel, CIA, MI6, Chile, Syria, Iraq, or South Africa. Story 11. Acoustic Kitty was a CIA project launched by the Directorate of Science and Technology, which in the 1960s intended to use cats to spy on the Kremlin and Soviet embassies. In an hour-long procedure, a veterinary surgeon implanted a microphone in the cat's ear canal, a small radio transmitter at the base of its skull, and a thin wire into its fur. This would allow the cat to innocuously record and transmit sound from its surrounding. Due to problems with distraction, the cat's sense of hunger had to be addressed in another operation. Victor Marchetti, a former CIA officer, said Project Acoustic Kitty cost about $20 million. The first Acoustic Kitty mission was to eavesdrop on two men in a park outside the Soviet compound on Wisconsin Avenue in Washington, D.C. The cat was released nearby, but was hit and ended by a taxi almost immediately. However, this was disputed in 2013 by Robert Wallace, a former director of the CIA's Office of Technical Service, who said that the project was abandoned due to the difficulty of training the cat to behave as required. And... The equipment was taken out of the cat. 
the cat was re-sown for a second time and lived a long and happy life afterward. Subsequent tests also failed. Shortly thereafter, the project was considered a failure and declared to be a total loss. Story 12. An atomic rifle, basically a nuke fired like an RPG. They were actually built and deployed. The theory was that the Soviet Union might be rolling thousands of tanks across the plains of Europe. So to stop them, soldiers would dig small foxholes, fire a nuke at the oncoming tank line, and duck into the foxhole because the RPG wouldn't be able to propel the nuke far enough away that the soldier would be outside the blast zone, so they'd need a foxhole to protect them from an atomic explosion. Yes, really. Story 13, Project Pluto. It's a bit older, 1960s. The plan was to make a ramjet engine that was powered by a nuclear reactor. In theory, it could fly at several times the speed of sound for months before running out of power. It would fly to a populated area, drop a nuclear bomb payload, and then fly at really low altitudes in a circle around the area. Flying so fast at really low altitudes creates a shockwave that prevents anyone from escaping the area. The nuclear reactor that powered it would be unshielded as well. So the populated area gets nuked, then the survivors cannot escape because of the shockwave and are subject to even more radiation as this thing keeps them trapped inside the area. It was eventually canceled when ICBMs were developed. Story 14. Turns out this was the FBI, not the CIA. Within the US, COINTELPRO. Imagine being taught history through the government's lens. There were groups struggling for rights, justice, and fairness. And in the end, the message you get is that the government is the will of the population. There were hiccups, but they are the good guys that are somewhat protecting you today. Then you read the black rights movement involving Martin Luther King was far more stacked against their favor with the CIA outright sabotaging any attempts at equality, only allowing planned peace protests on issues the government was not going to actually solve. The Black Panthers arming movement, the votes or guns speech that addresses their context makes them a lot braver and noble than history makes them out to be. Then you got all the socialist and anti-war activists like Abby Hoffman, who thought he was going crazy when the entire media, fellow activists included, seemed to shun him for some rumors against his identity. Turns out the CIA utilized the media to slander him in a way it feels just real enough. So now you don't know what's right, or if they will do that to current activists. Think about that. The whole US creates a truth about you, and you are expected to choose between activism without any social support, or give up and live a quiet life with the new truth. All because you brought up something revolutionary that goes against the current capitalist overlord's comfort. Story 15. Thing I learned in a class recently. The CIA invented the term conspiracy theory, as we currently know it in a memo outlining a strategy to discredit critics of the Warren Commission. That memo is a great example of how public opinion has been covertly manipulated for political purposes. Edit. The claim of novelty here is mistaken. Point taken. But the memo is still an interesting read. CIA Dispatch 1035. 960, widely available. Lance DeHaven Smith writes that the dispatch, along with John Roach's letter, is demonstrable evidence that the CIA manipulated the press to popularize the term conspiracy theory, to associate it with deranged thinking, and to encourage bullying attacks on Americans who express doubts about the official story of President Kennedy's murder. Roach's letter is the first publication linking paranoia, marginality, and religiosity, a priesthood of marginal paranoids, to the conspiracy theory concept. Story 16, Operation Mockingbird, where the CIA, DOD, and DOJ recruited journalists and media producers to selectively leak intel and propaganda to shape public opinion regarding foreign intervention. The program officially stopped decades ago, but continues in practice to this day. Project Follow Through was the most comprehensive study of diverse teaching methods completed in American history. The results showed a clear advantage for the philosophy of direct instruction, DI. But because it was unpopular and seen as stifling and difficult to implement, there was never any formal recommendation made to states about the results. Story 17, Operation Ghost Stories. Russian undercover agents were placed in America for years. I remember hearing an interview. It was on public radio, so as reputable a source as any, I guess. Anyway, the Russian spy in question was sent over when he was in his 30s. He had a wife and kids in Russia. Came to America to spy? To fit in. 
He got married to an American woman, had American kids, and a blue-collar job of some sort. Dude had two lives. Anyways, he ended up actually falling in love with wife in America, wanting to be with her. So he made the U.S. government a deal. He gave up Russian state secrets in return for immunity from espionage charges, and he got to become a U.S. citizen. Pretty interesting, if it was true. Story 18. The Cat Bomb. The U.S. Office of Strategic Services decided that the best way to ensure that their bombs reached the intended naval targets was to strap them to cats and drop the cats from planes with parachutes. It was believed that the cats would naturally avoid the water and direct their payload to enemy decks. The project was declared a failure because no way was found to stop the cats from fainting in midair. Story 19. The U.S. caused the death of the world's first commercial satellite, Telstar, only a few months after it was launched. We set up a nuclear blast in space, five actually, and that blast, Starfish Prime, created an electromagnetic pulse, EMP, that killed Telstar, which was placed in orbit the day after the test. The EMP effects energized the Earth's magnetic field long enough to cause the satellite to die on orbit. The government didn't tell AT&T what happened until around 2005 or so. Story 20. Project Thors. Project Thor is an idea for a weapon system that launches kinetic projectiles from Earth's orbit to damage targets on the ground. Jerry Pornell originated the concept while working in operations research at Boeing in the 1950s before becoming a science fiction writer. The system most often described as an orbiting tungsten telephone pole with small fins and a computer in the back for guidance. The system described in the 2003 United States Air Force report was that of 20-foot-long, 1-foot-diameter tungsten rods that are satellite-controlled and have global strike capability with impact speeds of Mach 10. The time between deorbiting and impact would only be a few minutes, and depending on the orbits and positions in the orbits, the system would have a worldwide range. There is no requirement to deploy missiles, aircraft, or other vehicles. Although the SALT-2, 1979, prohibited the deployment of orbital weapons of mass destruction. It did not prohibit the deployment of conventional weapons. The system is not prohibited by either the Outer Space Treaty or the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Some systems are quoted as having the yield of a small tactical nuclear bomb. Story 21. The U.S. Army SL-1 Nuclear Accident. The SL-1 was a low-power test reactor in Idaho. They shut the reactor down for the holidays. On January 3, 1961, three guys went in to power it back up after coming back from vacation. Part of the startup required they reconnect the control rods to the mechanism that raises and lowers them in the pile. To do this, they needed to manually raise the rods a few inches, read, grab the rod assembly by hand, and lift it. For some reason which isn't clear, the reactor operator who was lifting one of the rods suddenly lifted one of them almost two feet too far, probably because it was stuck, and he was praying pulling hard on it, and it broke free. This caused the reactor to immediately go critical and superheat the coolant water, causing a steam explosion and blasting the shield plugs out of the top of the reactor. Also not clear is why the shift supervisor was standing on top of the reactor at the time. He was found impaled by one of the shield plugs in the concrete ceiling of the reactor room. The explosion ended the operator instantly. The third participant survived the blast and was found in the reactor room by rescuers, but later succumbed to his injuries. The reactor melted down. The site was buried and abandoned. Story 22. Fun fact about MK Ultra. In the late 50s and early 60s, one of the head professors of psychology at Harvard decided to conduct an experiment on the school's brightest and most talented students. The purpose of the experiment was to observe and document what happens when you stress, bully, and overwhelm persons with high IQs. The students were publicly berated, even mocked by various professors participating in the program and fundamental ideologies were questioned and even attacked. Christians were exposed to logical flaws in the Bible. Atheists were challenged to explain the root of some of the most basic and mysterious components of the universe. Liberals were assaulted as weak and naive. Conservatives attacked for being greedy. Even the students' friends and family were fair game. The program was sponsored and overseen by the CIA and managed by Dr. Henry Murray. It began in 1959 and was scrapped in 1962. Dr. Murray was quite candid about his experiments after they concluded. One of the students who was an unwilling and unaware test subject was, wait for it, wait for it, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Story 23. In the early 1960s, 
an experimental nuclear reactor developed for the Army, exploded in the Idaho desert, ending three technicians. Their bodies were so badly radiated, they had to be buried in lead-lined coffins. The body of the man who most likely caused the prompt critical event wasn't found for quite some time. It wasn't until the emergency crews were able to look up at the roof of the containment building where the reactor exploded did they find him, impaled by the control rod that he accidentally withdrew too far. Story 24, Area 51 was an experimental airbase. The reason they guard it so closely isn't because of aliens, but rather that it's the place where we test very sensitive aircraft and similar things that have the potential to change warfare to a fundamental level. The SR-71 was developed there and tested many times. We also tried to develop a flying saucer. There's a video that shows someone driving a floating circular disc that Hitler had also tried to develop. They didn't go through with it because the scientists decided that the time would be wasted to try and make an actual high-altitude one. They declassified this a good bit ago, but people are too focused on the alien aspect that they don't care. Personally, I think the government would go to these extremes for technology that allows us to spy on our enemy's allies almost undetected much faster than they would for a little green dude. Story 25, MK Ultra. Many people have heard of it, but just assume it's just an old conspiracy theory promoted by hippies and don't bother looking into it. The CIA really did spend 30 years and millions of dollars experimenting on, mostly unwitting people with LSD and other drugs because they were trying to develop mind control techniques to use in espionage. None of it worked though. Most of the docs have been declassified and you can read all about it. The program was very extensive and some of the experiments they did were unbelievably messed up. Many subjects died, others went insane. Story 26, Project 100,000. In the early years of Vietnam, Robert McNamara created Project 100,000 as a way to draft those who previously failed to meet military, mental, and medical standards. This included a lot of Americans with an IQ below 70. Majority of these men didn't have above a ninth grade education and were, in a sense, a lot like Forrest Gump and Gomer Pyle. Because of obvious learning disabilities and difficulty understanding these morons, were mostly given jobs on the front lines of the war. It was worded as a service project, and they were told it would help them gain skills needed to live a better life after the service. In reality, they were cannon fodder for the DOD, and died at a much higher rate than their non-disabled counterparts. These men largely couldn't read, write, or understand why they were in Vietnam or what they were there to do. They suffered more cases of post-traumatic stress, lower unemployment rates, and higher rates of divorce and self-destruction than non-NSM veterans. Very sad story of the government taking advantage of its own citizens. Story 27. Project Sunshine, where the U.S. government bought remains of dead infants to test for radiation. When they took limbs from them, the parents were never told. One mother wasn't allowed to dress her daughter for her funeral because doctors had removed her legs and didn't want her to find out. Ugh, I recall reading something similar to this, where in more recent times, someone's mother had passed away and was an organ donor. It turned out the U.S. government used her body in a controlled explosion to see the effects of a bomb or IED family was totally unaware until after it happened. 